OK, after all this theory, let's actually see how this works in practice. Let's have a little bit of fun with linear algebra. So these are Jupyter notebooks. You can download them and play along exactly in the slide form, or you can just view them as they are, as notebooks. Um, if you want to look at them in slide form, you need the reveal plugin. Anyway, the first thing we need to do is we need to import ND array, which is the and array data type of MXNet. So from MXNet, import ND. That's all you need. Okay, so now that we've done this, let's actually create some of the most basic arrays. Namely, I could just go and create the array with an entry 2 and an entry 3. And if I do this, I can add them together, I can multiply them, I can divide them, or I can exponentiate them or anything else. I could subtract them from each other. Let's say we do this. Okay, let's say print x minus y equals x minus y. And now I get x minus y and yeah, lo and behold, the result is 1. So behaves exactly as you would expect it. Um, I can print them or I can go and convert them into scalars back into Python. Now, <clears throat> if I do that, then I can you know, continue working with them in Python land. And if you need to do that, that's fine. There's just one caveat, and that applies to essentially any deep learning framework. As soon as you go and convert from you know, the framework to Python, or the other direction, you need to hand over control to Python at least for some time. Now Python is particularly bad at multi-threading and multitasking. The result of that is that the code will, anything that you might be doing on maybe one or multiple GPUs will come to a grinding halt while Python does its thing and only then can you go back to doing things in parallel in, you know, in the framework. So don't do this thing too often, just occasionally. In other words, if you have a large for loop and you do that every for loop many, many thousands or millions of times, you will end up writing very inefficient code. So don't do it. Now vectors are, as you would expect it, just you know, sequences in this case of scalars. So for instance, if we want to generate a vector that goes from one to five, 1 to 0 to 4, well, we use a range. And I could, for instance, have you know different step sizes. All of those can be easily adjusted. But in this case here, it's x equals nd dot a range. And that's it. I can index individual entries, like x of 3. And it does exactly what you would expect. Now, one important thing is that you may want to look at the dimensionality and the shape of a vector. So the shape of a vector, <coughs> for instance, is, you know, you could have like a matrix, maybe a 2 by 3 matrix, and then the shape of that matrix would be 2 and 3, but the length, and, or, you know, maybe 6 and 1, but the length is just a number of non-zero entries. So if I call x shape, It'll just tell me the shape. In this case, it's a vector with one dimension, and there are five entries here. Now, the other thing is <coughs> you can go and multiply things. You can add them together. And by the way, in the future, when we talk about arrays versus dimensions, we say that the arrays have different dimensions if they have different axes. But we just have an n-dimensional vector, then we mean a vector of length n. And yeah, mind you, you can add things together. So for instance, we have an array 1, 2, 3, another array 1, 2, 10, 20, 30. If I add or multiply them, things work as we would expect it. Now matrices are just, you know, two-dimensional objects. OK, so we are, there we have it. And I can go and create such an object. So let's say. I maybe create a vector of length 10, 
where I create a vector of length 20 and then reshape it as 2 and 10, and I get that. Pretty straightforward, right? Um, <coughs> now you can look at the transpose of this, and that's just a dot t. Right? If I had, let's say, a 10-dimensional just single vector, then it would be just the row or column vector appropriately, but otherwise it's just that. Okay. Now tensors, well, we can go to three dimensions. Let's say we have an object that's of, you know, size two, three, and four respectively, two times three times four, so we get 24. And so therefore, if I create 24 ints, going from zero to 23 and arrange them in this way, I get this three-dimensional tensor. Now that's not too uncommon. For instance, I get tensors if I deal with images because in images I have, you know, width and height and unless the image is black and white, I also have RGB so I get three color channels. Or if you have some fancy satellite, you might have multispectral sensing so you might have an entire spectrogram per pixel in this case, I wouldn't have only three dimensions for RGB, but maybe 20, 30, maybe 100. Now, <coughs> you can do simple things with it. You can create, you know, zeros or ones. I can add them, I can multiply them. Mind you, this, so A is a scalar. This really just multiplies every entry of A by one, and then I add Y to it, right? So it's quite straightforward and the dimensions all stay the same. I can sum things and I can compute. So for instance, if I have a vector of ones, right? X is all ones, one, one, one. And very unsurprisingly, if I compute sum of X, I get three. Now, if I had say a two or three dimensional object, then maybe I might want to sum over only some of the dimensions, in which case, okay, let's try that. X is in the A range of, okay, let's see, 12. So if I do this, right, so it'll still you know, give me 66 and just that sum. But now if I wanted to compute a sum along the rows, or columns, and see here you would get a row sum. Basically that's one means that it keeps, that it sums along dimension one. If I had zero here, well, we'd get that, right? And so I can define the appropriate sums as I want. <coughs> so this is exactly what we had before. Now I can do interesting things like I can compute the mean of, let's say for instance, a matrix and well, the mean is of course just the sum divided by the number of entries and ND mean really doesn't do anything particularly special, but behind the scenes it just invokes in the sum and divides by the size. But since this is awkward to write all the time, it looks much prettier this way, and the array takes care of this for you. Now, life wouldn't be complete without dot products. So if I have, let's say, x and y, and I want to compute the inner product, well, I can do that by just invoking nd dot dot, and this doesn't do anything else but just pointwise multiply and sum. So if I wanted to find out how this looks like, I could perform print um, x times y, and I will get the same answer. Right. That's the element-wise product between xi and yi summed up, and I get 10. This is exactly the same result as in the dot product. 
And that's exactly what's on the slide too. Now, dot products are just a very simple case. Matrix vector products is where things get more exciting. So if I have, you know, matrix vector, then that's really just inner products between the X vector and the corresponding rows of A. So if I were to multiply A by X, well, I'd get this. And that's not very surprising because, yeah. Now, an important caveat. If you're used to MATLAB, you're probably used to thinking that A times X means the matrix vector multiplication of A and X. This is not the case. So what A times X means in MATLAB notation is dot star. Now you might wonder, you know, why does this even compute, right? Because after all, A is a three by four matrix and X is a, you know, four dimensional vector. So how can I even get something meaningful out of it? Well, it's very simple by something called broadcast where you just repeat the entries of X until you've gone all, through all the entries of A. But it's pointwise multiplication. So be careful of that because this can otherwise give you quite horrible bugs if you're not used to it. We're sticking to NumPy convention here, so it shouldn't be very surprising if you're used to NumPy. But if you're coming straight from MATLAB land, be careful since this is a rich source of bugs for beginners. Okay, matrix multiplication. Well, that's exactly what we had before, it's just now we have you know two objects. And so if you think about it, that's really just like going through all the entry, the rows of A and the columns of B, taking inner products and writing them out in a table. So there we go. ND dot between A and B, because one, one was a three by four, the other one is a four by three matrix. So very unsurprisingly, if I do multiply them, I get the three by three matrix out of it. Last thing are norms, and that's exactly what we discussed before. So they need to satisfy triangle inequality and so on. And if we want to invoke the L2 norm, I just call nd.norm. So nd.norm of x, there we go. Now if I want to compute the L1 norm, I could do this. I could just invoke nd.sum, nd.apps. Or I could just invoke the norm with a different power. That would also work. So abs is absolute value, as you would have already suspected. And indeed, dot sum is what we did before. And this ends our very, very brief introduction to linear algebra on MXNet. We'll look a lot more at the ND array data types in the following lecture. But for now, I hope this gives you a bit of an idea of how to do linear algebra in MXNet and to see that it's fairly straightforward and not very difficult. Okay, thank you very much.